At the start of the 14th century, the political landscape of Anatolia was comprised of a mosaic of small principalities, referred to as Beylix. Out of all of these, the most unlikely candidate, the Beylik of Osman, situated in the hinterlands of northwestern Anatolia, was the one that asserted its dominance above all the others. Within less than a hundred years, it metamorphosized into a power whose reach spanned both Asia and Europe. So just how did the smallest Beylik, situated on the frontier with the Byzantine Empire, go on to assert itself as the most dominant Beylik in Anatolia, and even conquer much of the Balkans? Despite the fact that we have very few primary sources from the 14th century, historians have been deeply interested in the nature of the early Ottoman polity and its imperial ascension. From the 1940s until the 1980s, the most popular explanation for the rise of the Ottomans was encapsulated by the Ghazar thesis. Proposed by the Austrian historian Paul Wittek in 1938, it boldly argued that the goal of the early Ottoman rulers was to fight for the cause of Islam against the non-believers. Defined by an ideology of holy war or jihad, the Ottomans were thus able to attract Ghazis, warriors fighting for Islam, who could help achieve this goal. Considering the Ottomans were situated on the frontier with the Christian Byzantines, there was an almost perpetual cycle of recruitment of Ghazis across Turkic Anatolia who could join the Ottoman army. Wittek's assertion of the early Ottomans being first and foremost Islamic holy warriors was largely framed by two pieces of evidence. First, an inscription erected in 1337 in Bursa described the second Ottoman ruler Orhan as Ghazi son of Ghazi. Secondly, a 15th century Ottoman poet described the early Ottoman rulers as Ghazis. Whilst the Ottoman status as Ghazis was somewhat important to their prestige, this thesis has come under heavy criticism for its relative simplicity. A number of questions can be asked which demonstrate the theory's flaws. If the Ottoman success was due to Gaza, then why did they recruit Byzantines into their ranks? We know that the early Ottomans employed a large number of Christians as soldiers and administrators. At the same time, why did the Ottomans put little to no pressure on Christians in their realm to convert to Islam? Not only that, but why did they exhibit moderation and even a keen interest in conciliation when it came to dealing with Christians? Besides their dealing with non-Muslims, if Gaza was so important for the Ottomans, then why did they fight their fellow Muslim Beyliks on a number of occasions? And perhaps most interestingly, if Gaza is a concept that is associated with Orthodox Islam, then why did the Ottomans allow a great deal of freedom for heterodoxy within Islam? The Ottomans were well known for not only allowing but in some cases sponsoring esoteric and folk-style religious sects which went hand in hand with them expanding their frontiers in the 14th century. Instead of an ideology of holy war, perhaps it would be wiser to search for the answer within the context of the time and place which the Ottomans occupied. Located on the fringes of Anatolia amongst many other Beyliks, the Ottomans were far from the reaches of the Mongol Ilkhanat, which sporadically made its presence felt across the peninsula. Their Byzantine neighbours, once seen as the epitome of imperial grandeur, were now a shadow of their former selves. The 14th century would prove to be a troubling and turbulent period for Byzantium, racked with civil wars and court intrigues that provided their Turkic foes with key opportunities to grow at their expense. The second Ottoman ruler, Orhan I's intervention in one such civil war in the 1350s, resulted in him gaining the important bridgehead Gallipoli. Even during Usman's rule, the Byzantines could rarely muster up the resources to confront the Ottomans where they were just starting out. The story was largely similar in the Balkans, once the Ottomans used Gallipoli to cross over to Thrace. There, the declining power of the Bulgarians and Serbians provided fertile ground for the Ottomans to make quick progress in their conquests. In addition to being fortunate regarding the weakness of their foes, 
the Ottomans were also lucky that they inhabited a region in Bithynia which was described by contemporary chroniclers as being prosperous and well populated. And with the obvious Byzantine decline, it was there for the Ottomans to take. Now, even though the Ottomans were fortuitous in where they were situated and the declining nature of the regional powers around them, they have to be given credit for the way that they took advantage of their good fortune. For instance, at a time when its opponents were struggling with unity and civil conflict, Ottoman successions were a fairly smooth, albeit often cutthroat process. Their practice of unigeniture, whereby their territories were held intact under a single heir during a succession, was a departure from what most of their fellow Turkic Anatolian Beyliks did, who instead followed the Turco-Mongolian tradition of dividing a realm amongst various heirs, which more often than not, proved to be an impediment to continued growth and progress and ultimately paved the way for a fracturing of the realm. The Timurid Empire is a good example of this, as it would soon become fractured under Timur's progeny. In fact, one could go as far as saying that the best reason in explaining the rise of the Ottomans was their own competence. Despite having started out with nomadic roots, within a few generations it had learned how to administrate an empire that encompassed numerous languages, ethnicities and religions. This ability to develop an organizational infrastructure gave it a solid foundation that not only facilitated growth, but also allowed it to absorb the shock of devastating events such as the Ottoman Interregnum. Their practice of not dividing the realm during a succession was actually part of a larger characteristic that might have been the most effective strategy in their rise to power. This was their focus on centralizing their authority. Despite being uncommon within Turkic politics, this actually allowed them to constantly fine-tune the Ottoman machine so that it ensured the smooth running of the Ottoman imperial project. During the conquests of Orhan and Murad I, they prevented the establishment of autonomous principalities in areas entrusted to high-ranking officers. This had been a feature of the Anatolian Beylik's political landscape. For example, the Beylik of Aydin was established by commanders who started out under the Girmiyans in western Anatolia. This would prove to be a real problem for the Ottomans. In the early stages, they relied very heavily on certain frontier warrior leaders in acquiring and governing new territories. It would almost have been the natural thing for those frontier warrior leaders to assume autonomy over their territories and eventually detach from the Ottoman state. Instead, what happened was the Ottoman ruler was able to centralize more and more power into his own hands. Perhaps the most important component of their centralizing thrust was the Janissaries. As the Ottoman ruler transformed himself from a bey to a sultan, there was a need to have access to a source of power which circumvented Turkic tribal dynamics. Even though the Devshirme system of youth levies from which the Janissaries were recruited from was institutionalized in Bayezid I's reign in the 1390s, there is evidence to suggest that this practice was in place during the reign of Murad I. There are even some who claim that the practice has its roots in the time of Orhan, whose brother and vizier Alaeddin Pasha was said to have started it. Having implemented the youth levy policy at such an early phase of their development, just goes to show how the Ottomans were able to distinguish themselves from their fellow Turkic Beyliks. In time, those who were recruited from the Devshirme would form part of the governing class of the Ottoman Empire in the peak of its imperial glory. The robust manner in which young Christian boys could go on to attain positions of authority sheds light onto a fascinating point that is keenly highlighted by Turkish historian Cemal Kafadar. He states that a system like this could be conceivable only in a state born of these frontier conditions. The meritocratic emphasis of the Dev Shirme would undoubtedly have been correlated to frontier society, which, with all of its harsh conditions, would naturally have engendered a greater respect for merit rather than status. Merit always has practical benefits, status only sometimes does. The impact of being situated on a frontier is key to understanding the nature of the Ottoman polity. Throughout history and regardless of where, Frontiers are often places which have a tremendous degree of mobility and fluidity. 
people could move from place to place, allegiance to allegiance, and even faith to faith with an ease that is tough to imagine in more settled and stable societies. The Anatolian frontier would have been no different. The prominent Byzantine renegade, Kose Mehal, was just one of the many Byzantines to change their allegiance to the Ottomans and in time even convert to Islam. For the Ottomans, they had no issues with inheriting the administrative influences of both the Perso-Islamic and Byzantine traditions. The fluid and mobile nature of the frontier was amply exhibited by the revolt of Sheikh Badreddin. A prominent Muslim scholar and mystic, Sheikh Badreddin's mother was the daughter of a Byzantine commander whose castle was taken by Sheikh Badreddin's Ghazi father. In 1416, he would lead a revolt on the European frontier marches which was centered on syncretic beliefs that aimed to do away with divisions between Christians and Muslims. His revolt was supported by thousands of Muslims and Christians alike. Within this context, it is not surprising to hear historian Caroline Finkel say that coexistence and compromise between different manifestations of religious belief and practice is one of the abiding themes of Ottoman history. The mobility of the frontier was also likely the source behind the sharp appreciation the Ottomans had for pragmatism. When the fourth ruler, Sultan Bayezid, wanted to assert his dominance over the other Beyliks, he would get a fatwa, a ruling given by a recognized authority on a point of Islamic law. He charged that the Beyliks undermined his efforts to wage a jihad against the Christian powers in the Balkans. Whilst the emphasis on jihad might make you think that this lent support to the Ghazza thesis, in actuality, this was an example of the Ottomans employing real politique to achieve their goals. Even though Bayezid received fatwas, his suppression of the Beyliks actually depended on the usage of Christian soldiers provided by his vassals, such as Serbia. This just goes to show the nuanced nature of the Ottomans approach to governance and policy making. As I'm sure you can appreciate by this point, understanding the nature of the Ottoman polity at this early stage can be a complicated and confusing affair. Perhaps the best encapsulation of it has been provided by Chamal Kafadar, who eloquently stated that a more comprehensive view of the emergence and trajectory of Ottoman power is gained by looking at it as a coalition of various forces, some of which were eventually driven to drop out of the enterprise or subdued or marginalized. In other words, it was a history of shifting alliances and conflicts among various social forces, which themselves were undergoing rapid transformation while constantly negotiating their position within the polity. The early makeup of the Ottoman state was heavily dependent upon forces such as the frontier warriors, the pastoralist tribes, and even heterodox dervishes. But in time, all three of these initially vital components of the state were suppressed by the centralizing nature of the Ottomans. We already saw what happened to Sheikh Badreddin and his heterodox supporters. Similarly, Many prominent frontier warrior families slowly lost their eminence to the momentum of Ottoman centralization. The Byzantine renegade Kose Mehal had a great deal of parity in his relationship with Usman, but his family, the Mehal Oglu, were definitively brought under the authority of the Sultan and incorporated into the hierarchical structure of the Ottoman Empire, largely in the shape of commanders of frontier regions in the Balkans. In my opinion, the Ottoman centralizing instincts and their frontier mentality combined to make them the energetic and dynamic force that they became. One could argue that the Ottomans' mentality as a frontier principality came to an end with the conquest of Constantinople in 1453, from which point it became a certified imperial polity. A perfect example of this metamorphosis was provided by Mehmet Fatih's decision to stop standing up at the sound of martial music a tradition that was adhered to by his predecessors in order to demonstrate their reputation as frontier warriors. Mehmet's decision to abandon the tradition was a signal to all that the Ottoman ruler had reached a loftier status than just a frontier warrior leader. Now they were sultans, Caesars, and even in time caliphs.
Thank you guys for joining me. I know this video may have felt like it could have been shorter, but I'm just really interested in the Ottomans. They were a pretty funky empire and I wanted to go into a fair amount of detail. As usual, I want to give a shout out to all of my Patreons for sticking with me. If you want to support the channel, there's a link to my Patreon in the description to this video. Until next time, peace.